Muy buenos días o buenas tardes, amados amigos y hermanos good morning, presentes, or good afternoon, ministros, beloved friends and brethren present, fellow ministers, partners, and other people, and children present, and also those who are in other countries connected to this service. May the blessings of Christ, the angel of the covenant, be upon all of you and also upon me. And may he speak directly to our soul at this end time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Let's read in Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 11 to 22. And... The Apostle Paul, speaking, says the following. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain and one new man, so make him peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The house of God of the New Covenant. You may be seated if you are so kind. We find that the house of God is God's habitation or dwelling place. 
Throughout biblical history, we find him in the midst of the Hebrew people. The Hebrew people as the house of God, the people of God, in the midst of whom God dwelt. And that is why, in the midst of the Hebrew people of Israel, was the tabernacle that Moses built, where God's presence was, and the sacrifices that God required were carried out in that tabernacle that God showed Moses for him to build. Then, once they come into the promised land, later on, the temple is built by Solomon in Jerusalem, where the same pillar of fire, the presence of God, went into that temple, into the most holy place of that temple, and positioned itself upon the mercy seat, which is the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, where two cherubims of gold, one on each side, are on the mercy seat, which is the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, and which is made of gold. There, in the midst of those two cherubims, was the presence of God. Therefore, God was in a literal temple dwelling between the two cherubims of gold in the most holy place, which is the most important place in the temple. It is the soul, the heart of the temple, just as the soul, the heart of the human being, is the most holy place where God dwells in everyone who has received him as Savior. And just as the tabernacle and also the temple built by Solomon were built, the person is built, goes on being built as a temple of God, where God dwells in Holy Spirit. And the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the temple of the New Covenant as a mystical body of believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which St. Paul tells us is the temple of God. And in Hebrews chapter 3, St. Paul tells us from verse 1 and on to 6, he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. 
For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And now, the house of God under the new covenant is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The presence of God came out of Solomon's temple or the temple that was there in Jerusalem and where did it go? It went to his spiritual temple. On the day of Pentecost, we find him, God, in the pillar of fire, entering to and in all those believers in Christ who were in the upper room waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And from age to age, we find that the spiritual temple of Christ, the church, has been built, constructed out of living stones. People who hear the preaching of the gospel the faith of Christ is born in their soul and they receive him as their only and sufficient Savior. They are baptized in water in his name and Christ baptizes them with the Holy Spirit and fire and brings forth the new birth in them. And thus, they are placed as members of the house of God, sons and daughters of God. And as individuals, they're also a spiritual temple where the Holy Spirit dwells in the soul of the believers in Christ. It's in God's house, under the new covenant, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which also contains those living stones which form that spiritual temple and who as individuals are also a spiritual temple just like Christ who said in St. John, chapter 2, verse 19, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Many thought he was referring to the temple of stone, but he was referring to his body as a temple where God dwelt in all his fullness. And the Apostle Paul tells us that we are a temple of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21 and on, he says, 
in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now notice how St. Paul, in different passages, in his letters, shows that the believers in Christ who form the church are part of that temple of God as a mystical body of believers. And as individuals, they are a temple for God. And whoever destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. Those who have been destroying the church of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the different stages of the church have a serious problem before God. God will destroy them. And those who destroy a believer who is a temple of God, God will destroy that individual. Therefore, we must be aware of who we are and what we are in the divine program. And that in the mystical body of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are people who work some under a ministry and others with another ministry and so forth. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers according to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 where it talks to us about these ministries and in 1 Corinthians it tells us of these ministries. Therefore, not everyone is an ear or a nose or eyes. Each person has a part to be carried out and therefore is represented in some part of the body. And as a mystical body of believers, the church has different stages. It began from the bottom up, different from the gentle kingdom, which started from the top, the head of gold of Nebuchadnezzar's time and his kingdom to the bottom, and it is currently in the feet of iron and clay, its last stage. And now, from stage to stage, 
han estado siendo llamados y juntados. Those who have formed the church of the Lord Jesus Christ have been called and gathered in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, each one in its time, which Reverend William Branham shows in the book of the seven church ages and he shows it in a simple way so that everyone understands it. For example, it says on page 155 and 156 of the Book of the Church Ages, In the last paragraph, he says, The message is then broadcast to all. But though it is broadcast for all who come within range of the message, that message is received individually by only a certain qualified group in a certain way. Each individual of that group is one who has the ability to hear what the Spirit is saying by way of the messenger. Those who hear are not getting their own private revelation nor is a group getting their collective revelation. But each person is hearing and receiving what the messenger has already received from God. That is the divine order in the house of God of the New Covenant the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is being formed as a spiritual temple from age to age. And the people who live on earth at the time in which they live can only form part of the stage or age relevant to that time. He cannot say, I'm going to wait for another age to come in. No, every believer in Christ, written in heaven in the Lamb's Book of Life, comes into the age relevant to him when God reveals his word to the messenger of that age. He receives it, believes it, it becomes flesh in him, and he proclaims it. And the Holy Spirit through that messenger is speaking that word that he gave to the messenger. Now he is speaking it to the public. And he that is of God hears God's voice. Christ says in St. John, chapter 8, verse 47, and also in St. John, chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I know them, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. The Father who gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Some people think that the Father was far away, yet he says, the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Where was the Father? In him. In Jesus Christ was the fullness of of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Everything was in Jesus. That is why Christ said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. The Holy Spirit, the angel of the covenant, the heavenly body of God, was where? In Christ, in Jesus. Remember that he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And he began to say why he had been anointed. And then also, on another occasion, he says, The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So, there was the Holy Spirit and there was a Father. In other words, there was the Angel of the Covenant, which is the Holy Spirit, and there was the Father. Just like in a human being, there is a soul, the spirit, and the body that identifies him as a human being living here on earth. Once he leaves this body, he can no longer be identified as a human being because he no longer has the body. He already went to the dimension of the spiritual bodies to the spirit world to the place relevant to him according to what he had done on earth. If he received Christ as Savior, he goes on to paradise. If he did not receive him, he goes to another dimension and he will stay there until the second resurrection in order to be judged. And once he is judged, then it will be known whether he will live eternally or not according to what he has done in his body. But God select who form the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, if they die physically, they go on to paradise in a spiritual body and soul. And in the coming of Christ at the last day, they will return to receive the new, eternal, immortal, and glorified body, just like the glorified body of Christ our Savior. That is what the coming of Christ at the last day is for. And where does the scripture say that he will come? To his temple. And the Lord shall come to his temple, to his house, to his family. He will come to raise the dead, believers in him, into glorified and young bodies and to transform the believers in Christ who are alive in those days. And thus, we will have the double garment. We will have the fullness a heavenly body, and a glorified physical body to be able to go with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will have the wedding garment on. One cannot go to our Heavenly Father's house without the wedding garment because without it, the person cannot be interdimensional. We need the new body to be able to leave this earth and go with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And just like the groom and the bride who are going to a wedding get dressed up, they put on the wedding garment, they fix up their hair and face, well, notice... Christ is going to do that with the believers. He is going to fix us completely. Sometimes when people go to a wedding, they say, 
The groom looks so good. And the bride looks gorgeous. She looks beautiful. And how will we look in the new and young and glorified bodies? The angels will say it. And we will enjoy that new, young, and eternal body. That was what God eternally had in His mind for me and for each one of who? Of you. To manifest us with eternal life in young buddies, glorified bodies. That is God's eternal plan that was in God's mind. And that is what God will do at this end time. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord to his house, just as he came to the house, his house of the old covenant, his house, his family Israel, he will come to the house of the new covenant, his church, which is made up of Gentiles and Jews. Because in the mystical body of Christ, it doesn't matter whether one is a Gentile or Jew, he is a member of God's house of the New Covenant who is waiting for the coming of his Lord. He has placed apostles, evangelists, prophets, pastors, and teachers in his house. And from age to age, there is an overlap between a new age and the age that is ending. And it becomes it becomes a joint in the mystical body of Christ where one age overlaps with another age as it happens in the overlap between one dispensation with another dispensation. God makes that joint. God places it by using the messenger of that age and he brings the word for that age. Also, in that age, alongside the messenger, he places those who will have a ministerial work, some apostles. The messenger is the main apostle and prophet relevant to that time. Among them is St. Paul and some of the other messengers and Reverend William Branham. And this is how God carries out his work. And he places different pastors, people in the pastoral ministry, in the evangelistic ministry, and in teachers' ministry to teach and so forth. Each one working in the work according to the ministry that God has placed in the person. They are taught by the Holy Spirit through what he spoke to the messenger of that age and then what he spoke to the people through 
that messenger. From there comes a divine revelation for those who will be in different ministries, different labors in the work of the Lord, who should not alter that word, but instead bring it and may it be flesh also in them and in the other people and thus they will become the word made flesh for that time along with the messenger of that time the portion of the word that becomes flesh at that time for our time there is a lot of promised word that must become flesh in me and in who else? In each one of you too. The thunders. What the thunder spoke must become flesh in me and in each one of you. Because that is how we will obtain the faith, the revelation to be transformed and taken with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The thunders will reveal the mystery of the seventh seal, the mystery of the second coming of Christ, the greatest mystery in the whole Bible to the extent that when it was opened in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, it caused silence in heaven for about half an hour. That exceedingly great mystery is the one that will be revealed to the believers in Christ at the last day to give them the faith to be transformed and taken with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb who will be hearing the voice of Christ, the voice of the Holy Spirit through the relevant divine order, and that will be hearing the mighty angel that comes down from heaven crying as when a lion roars. That is, they will be hearing Christ as lion, no longer as a lamb, but as lion, revealing the mystery of his coming and bringing the title deed, the little book open, the title deed of eternal life, the title deed that contains all the rights of each son and daughter of God. In other words, Christ at the last day as lion is the defender of the rights of all the sons and daughters of God. He will claim all our rights as sons and daughters of God and we will be restored to everything that belongs to us as sons and daughters of God, to eternal life with everything that eternal life includes as an inheritance for each son and daughter of God. That is why St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and on, says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus our Lord. Everything that Christ is heir to, so are we as believers in Christ. That is the inheritance of the saints in light of Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and on. We have an inheritance of which we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. And it is an eternal inheritance, not only spiritual, but physical eternal life as well. 
and in all other things, we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ of the kingdom of God. Not only of the earthly kingdom, but of the heavenly kingdom as well. Everything that belongs to Christ also belongs to us. And we belong to Christ and Christ to us. He is our Redeemer, our Savior. Therefore, let's be fitly joined together and supplied by the joints through which we are fed. In other words, there are people placed in different positions in the mystical body of Christ that help us so that the spiritual food reaches every person. If the spiritual food doesn't reach a certain part, that person dies. Just like if what we eat doesn't reach a part of the body, the cells die and we must remove that part of the body. Therefore, let's be spiritually well-fed just like we want to be physically well-fed. Being physically nourished is good, and if physical food is good, spiritual food is even better because it is for our soul. Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The word that proceeds out of the mouth of God for the time in which a person lives is a spiritual food. It comes from God through the Holy Spirit to the messenger, and from the messenger it goes on to the people. Where... The messenger has many helpers who take that word and give it to the people, like when Christ carried out the miracle of the loaves and fishes, where he asked them to sit down by fifties, to sit on the grass, and he told his disciples, now give it out. He gave them physical food to distribute, which is a top and figure of the spiritual food. So there will always be faithful helpers alongside the messenger of each time for the distribution of the spiritual food that God gives for his church in each stage of his church. God wants us to be spiritually well-fed and to be holding on tight to Christ all the days of our lives. May no problem, struggle, temptation, or problem, big or small, take you out of the Lord's way. Hold on tight to Christ and remain steadfast, following Christ, receiving the spiritual food, and waiting for your transformation. There is no hope in this world except in Christ. There is no hope for mankind except the coming of Christ at the last day to his house, his church, which his church has been waiting throughout these 
2,000 years since the day of Pentecost until now. And his church is still waiting for his coming, which will be a blessing, a blessing to all the believers in him for the resurrection of the believers who died physically to raise them up in glorified bodies which are young and eternal and to change us who live on this earth and thus give us the eternal, immortal, incorruptible, and glorified body like the one he has. But if you have to depart, don't worry. The important thing is to worry about being on good terms with God, holding on tight to Christ. That guarantees you that you will return with Christ in His coming. Therefore, let's be holding on tight to Christ our Savior. Today, February 28th, we commemorate the coming of the angels that appeared to Reverend Willem Branham and appeared in that cloud that was captured in photographs by the photographers of different magazines such as Life Magazine and Science Magazine. They don't know what happened, but by divine revelation that was given to Reverend William Branham, who was there, he made known what happened. Those were angels who visited him, and one of them the most notable to Reverend William Branham, of whom he says he was the one with the seventh seal, picked him up, left him up, and he was gathered with them. And they sent him. The angel told him to go to Jeffersonville, Indiana, to the Branham Tabernacle, the church where he ministered, which bore his name for the opening of the seals of Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 and on. So, today, February 28, 2015, many years have already passed since this exceedingly important event in the Divine Program. Fifty-two years have already passed from 1963 to today, 2015. We remember that day and we Remember that day. We trust that we will be ready soon. And may the church of the Lord Jesus Christ be completed. And may we all be ready for our transformation. Because his second coming to his church is to transform us and to take us with him to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is what the scripture says he is coming for, and that is what we're waiting on him for. We don't want to be here on earth much longer. 
when all of us are ready and the church is completed, we will go with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Therefore, we wait and pray that soon His church is completed and we are all ready for the coming of the Lord. Tomorrow, we will be speaking about that subject and the subject, Who is the Son of Man on this day? And we will speak as far as God allows us to speak on that subject. Reverend William Branham, on page 22 of the Book of Quotations in Spanish, says that that the Son of Man will manifest Himself again. In Reverend William Branham, there was a manifestation of the Son of Man. That manifestation was there. And another manifestation of the Son of Man will take place again. Therefore, we await from God the fulfillment of the divine promise. Notice on page 23, paragraph 186 of the Book of Quotations in Spanish, He says, speaking of the Samaritan woman, he says, she ran into the city and she said, come, see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? And he never did that one time to a Gentile. Why? He left it till this day. That's what he said here. In the days when the Son of Man shall reveal himself from heaven. He's revealing himself now to the church for mercy. The next time he reveals himself is in destruction to those who have rejected the message. In other words, there will be another manifestation or revelation of the Son of Man. So then, he will no longer be as lamb and priest, but as judge and king. We are waiting for the blessings that he has for us to give us the faith to be transformed and raptured, which is contained in the thunders of Revelation 10, which is the voice of Christ, the mighty angel, crying out as when a lion roars. Therefore, let's be prepared to receive what he has for us in order to prepare ourselves for His coming. The house of God under the New Covenant or of the New Covenant, that has been our subject. And that house of God is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, of which you are a living stone because God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, said John the Baptist, son of Abraham. It is not 
that he raises up children unto Abraham out of literal stones, but out of people. May God bless you, keep you, and may he help us all to be prepared for our transformation. Continue having a happy afternoon, and I'll leave missionary Miguel Bermudez Marin with you again. We are at the time in which all the signs are being manifested. We are at the time in which mankind, the world, is like in the days of Lot and like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are the days, like in the time of Noah, like in the time of Abraham, like in the time of Lot, and like in the days of Jesus. And that is the time in which we have been given to live. And it is the most important time of all times. I wouldn't trade it for the time of St. Paul. He would. He'd say, it's a deal, but no. No one can change the time for which one was chosen by God to live on this earth. The person can't decide when to come to earth, nor when to leave. It is up to God. Therefore, the important thing is to make the most of our time in the divine program by carrying out the work that pertains to us. We have missionary Miguel Bermudez Marín here now. He always stays put because he says he is waiting for dessert. And some people say he has a sweet tooth and he really likes dessert. And so do all of us. Spiritual dessert, which is the best dessert we can receive. Still, Miguel is on his way already. May God bless you and keep you all. And we will see each other again this afternoon to continue speaking. Miguel will tell you where we will see each other. Well, God bless you, Miguel. May God bless and keep all those who are present here and those who are in other nations. And on Sunday, tomorrow, we will also be here and we will be speaking on the subject Who is the Son of Man? May God bless and keep you all.